So our scripture reading today is from Luke. It's chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And for one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend and expect nothing in return and your reward will be great and your sons are the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. So <clears throat> be merciful even as your father is merciful. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. So I call this the golden rule message. And it was a pretty, sometimes I really struggle on, on a name to come up. But this one was pretty, pretty easy. And so this is going to be group participation. So when you think of the golden rule, what do you guys think of? You're going to have to speak up. That was too mumbled. Do unto, do unto others as you want to to be done to you. So one of the problems with translations of the Bible is that, um, and most of them are Greek translations, is that the Greeks had like 32 versions of what love meant. And so for us, I think we just kind of think of love as caring for people. So we just have this one concept of love. But in this case, when they're talking about love, it really means a benevolence towards others. And, and so that changes all the time. And so I thought it's important to know so that you have an idea. And, and so the idea is, if, when you go through this scripture, it's no matter what somebody does to you, no matter what that was, we always want the best for them. And sometimes that's hard for us because we like things, the common term is, we like things to be fair which means if something bad happens to somebody else or they did something to us, then something bad should happen to them because we want everything to be fair and equal. And that's not what this scripture is about. It's about we want the best for whoever it is, even if they haven't been the best towards us. So the children's story, I get an email every week. It comes on Saturday or Sunday. And it has video in it. And I've showed the video a couple times, but a lot of times I don't care for the video. I thought about using it this week. Um, it's uh, two older guys, about my age, two older guys, one sitting on the bench, the other one comes up and sits down beside him. And he looks at him and he says, hi, Joe, how are you? And he said, I'm sorry, I don't think I know you. And he says, well, a long time ago we were in school together. And he said, I don't remember you. And he said, well, my name is, we're going to call him Francis today because I don't remember what the video said. He goes, my name was Francis. And he said, oh, I remember you. We're the, you were the one that we all called Twinkle Toes Francis. And he goes, yeah, I remember that. And he said, oh, I remember. The reason they call you that is because I used to throw darts at your feet and make you dance so that you wouldn't get hit by the darts. And that name stuck with you from elementary clear through high school. I remember that now. And he, Francis, said, yeah, I remember that too. And he said, do you remember that time we were at the school uh, auditorium and the whole school was there and I got you and pulled down your pants and showed your underwear to everybody in the whole school? <clears throat> he goes, yeah. He said, I still remember that too. And he said, remember when we were in high school and I locked you in your locker and you were locked in it for about two or three hours before anybody realized you were missing? He said, yeah, I, I remember that too. And he said, well, I haven't seen you for 50 years. Why all of a sudden are you wanting to see me? He said, I came to tell you I was sorry. And he said, well, why are you sorry? He said, 
because I wouldn't let those things that you did to me go from me. I held on to those. And the whole time I was holding on to them, I wished that something bad would happen to you because I wanted to get even. And he said, well, I'd forgotten all about those things. And he said, well, you might have forgot about them, but he said, I didn't because I remembered what you did to me. And those things that you did to me as a child, I hung on to for a long time. But he said, you know what? I found the Lord and he said, I'm, I'm not going to hold on to those things anymore. And he said, I looked you up to find you. And a friend of mine told me that you sat on this bench every day. And I wanted to come and tell you that I'm sorry for the way I wanted bad things to happen to you. I, and, and, and although I, I just decided not to use that video, I thought that it really told the story of this scripture because he really, for most of his life, wanted something bad to happen to the other guy. He wanted to get even for the way he felt he was treated and the way he was treated. And so this idea of being kind to someone, it's not just be kind as people have the chance. So Benita and I traveled yesterday. We spent the part of the day in Toledo, Ohio, and part of the day in Bowling Green, Ohio. And the reason we did that, because we watched the women Ball State basketball team lose to Toledo, very close game by the by, but we watched the men beat Bowling Green. And they're only about 30 minutes apart, so we made that trip. And so a lot of times at college basketball games, somebody throws a t-shirt into the crowd, right? And I can just tell you that I have no use for a Bowling Green t-shirt, okay? It's an odd color of orange if you've never seen it. And so the cheerleader threw one up in the Ball State section. I have no idea why, but there were Bowling Green people sitting behind us, and it landed right beside me, and I picked it up. And I knew there was a couple little kids behind me, and so I turned around and gave it to the little kid. Because, again, I am not going to wear a Bowling Green t-shirt, but it was nice that they threw it that way. And her dad was so surprised that I gave it to him. Now, at the Ball State games, when they threw out t-shirts, not all adults, but a lot of the adults will give them to a kid sitting around them because A, they're too small, and B, what do you need with another Ball State shirt if you're already there? And so he, he seemed really surprised that we did that. And we didn't know each other. I don't, he had on Bowling Green stuff, so we'll assume he was from around there somewhere. And he, he said, well, that was really nice. So he, got, he gets up later, and he said, hey, I'll go down. He, cause, they didn't have a very big crowd and they only had one concession. He said, if you guys want anything to drink, water or Coke or anything, just let me know. He said, I'm going, I'll bring you back some, which was really nice of him. And so we ended up, and after the end of the game, he thanked us again for giving him the T-shirt and said how much he, his daughter appreciated it. But we didn't know each other, and it's very unlikely, and I do mean very unlikely, that we'll ever see each other again. I mean, we just won't. But it was an opportunity to be nice to somebody. I had to go a little bit out of my way because I had to turn around and hand her the shirt. But outside of that, <laughs> but I did have to drive 300 miles to get all the places I went yesterday. But this idea is you're gonna go out of your way to be kind to people, to be helpful to people. You're not just gonna do it as it happens, but you, you have to think about those things sometimes. And so when I'm at a game and they're throwing out t-shirts, I start looking around to see where the kids are. Because if I get one, I'm going to give one to the nearest kid by me. And, and so you have to think these things through. Now, if it were up to us to be kind to people, especially people that are mean to us, we'd never get it done. Because just like the two guys on the bench that had issues when they were younger, we have issues sometimes when we're younger and we have issues sometimes when we're older, but we hang on to those things. We don't let them go very easy. And, and they, they get in our way. But by the grace that God offers to all of us, whether we accept it or not, it gives us the opportunity to let those things go and not hang on to them. And so I bet whether it's you or, or someone in your family that something happened to them, and a lot of times it's a family member or somebody they thought was a close friend, they, that thing that happens, they can't let it go. And it bothers them for the rest of their lives. They just can't let it go. And, and so I think part of what we can learn from this scripture is don't be hanging on to that stuff. Let it go. So I kind of talked about this once already. But so this whole idea is to actively do something, to make an effort to do something. And it should be positive shouldn't be negative and it should be a good thing so when it talks about 
you know, being kind to others, it really means being kind to everyone. Now, one of the things that I think is funny when someone will say, well, I'm as good as, so pick a neighbor. I'm as good as that neighbor. Well, the goal here is not to be as good as, the, as your neighbor. The goal is to be better than your neighbor. And by you being better to your neighbor, it'll make that neighbor be better. And so when we talk about the violence and the trouble that we see around the world, if we could all do that, try to be better to the next person than that person is to us, then the world would get progressively better. Now, so I talk about my neighbor sometimes, and, I've, and we've talked about Dave, and he passed away. And, and so I'm going to tell stories about Dave. And if Dave was still with us, when I would get home today, I would go over to Dave's house and say, hey, Dave, I talked about you in church today. Here's the story I told about you. So we know that Dave can hear us because I'm sure Dave's in heaven. So I met Dave and his wife because they were customers of mine at the bank. Um, I talked him into moving into the house next door because... We had a really, really good neighbor named Bill who lived there the first 25 years that we lived in the house. And we had talked about moving one time, and Bill heard about it. He came over and he goes, I really, really don't want you guys to move. He said, I've had a couple chances to sell the house, but I never wanted to move away because you guys are just such good neighbors. And we helped each other. And so in Yorktown, not, remember, where's he? Remember, you're supposed to be defending me about Yorktown from now on. Hey, yeah, okay. <laughs> And the way my addition is, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> and so the way my addition works, the house on the corner, which was Bill and then Dave later, they got their electricity from in town. And my electricity came from out of town. There's nothing worse than sitting in a cold, dark house and looking out your window and seeing your neighbor's Christmas lights, okay? It's just not really very good. And so whether it was Dave or Bill, <clears throat> he would let us run the extension cord from his front outlet, and we were, never lost food no matter which of the different ice storms we had because we could run a refrigerator and freezer. It didn't really make the house warm, but at least we didn't have to mess around with losing food at the same time. And, and so I talked, and then we had a neighbor when Bill sold his house, not the best neighbor, and I wish her well, but I'm not really sad that she left. She was not, it just wasn't a very good deal. And so I talked Dave into buying the house, and he fixed it up, but his wife Cheryl passed away before Dave ever got there. And, and so it was pretty sad, but Dave moved into a lot smaller home, and it was easier for him to take care of. And so every Wednesday morning when I go to Kwana's movie, or uh, meeting, um, the trash man comes at, he's supposed to be there after 6, he comes about 5.30. You cannot take your trash out on the day he's supposed to come because you, can, you cannot get up early enough to meet that guy there. And so when I go to my meeting, because it's about 6.30, I would always bring in Dave's trash can and mine as well. But if it was not picked up for some reason, or if we were gone or anything like that, uh, Dave would always, I'd hear my trash can coming up the driveway because Dave got out there first. And Dave was a really good cook. Now, does anybody like banana cake with yellow icing? Dave made it really well. It's kind of a sheet cake thing. So he'd be bringing over cake all the time. So any weight I gained during the pandemic, I'm blaming on Dave and that banana sheet cake stuff. Um, but he did that sort of stuff. And, and he just was a really good neighbor. And you he just was the nicest guy in the whole entire world. And so that example of what Dave was as a neighbor is what we're supposed to do to our neighbors. Now, I've talked about this before, but who are our neighbors? Say it louder. Everybody. Okay? It's just not literally Dave and, or Bill before him or Bob and Carolyn across the street or Janet next door or Steve on the other way. And I said, we've been pretty lucky to have really good neighbors. When Chris and Janet lived next door, Benita had whatever they call that surgery where they rotor rooter out your sinuses. And one of the really scary things about that is you can start to bleed from the surgery. And on a Sunday night, I think like this Sunday before the holiday, Benita had the surgery earlier in the week and she came out of the bathroom. She goes, I cannot get my nose to stop bleeding. And it's like 1030. Now the problem, so Steve, you can tell your brother, because I think I've told him this. The problem was that Steve's brother Gary lived two houses down, and Janet and Chris lived next door. 
Their phone numbers were exactly the same except for the last two digits. I still, trying to call one today, will call the other, okay? I, when I dialed the phone, I really didn't know which of those two was gonna answer. But I did know that whichever two answered would be over there because I needed somebody to watch the girls because they were asleep. If they woke up, I didn't want them to wake up to an open house. And before I got her to the car, I ended up calling Chris. Could have been Gary just as easy, but that was the number I remembered that day. Chris was over there and he watched the girls until we got back a couple hours later. And they never even knew we were gone. Which, when something bad happens, that's the best way for it to happen. Those are the kind of neighborly things that we're supposed to do, not just for our neighbors, but for the whole entire world. That is our responsibility. That is what this scripture is asking us to do. It's to be as kind as we can to everybody we can, every chance and all the time we have to be able to do that. And so we can say, well, why, why do we want to do that? What difference does it make to us? Well, for one thing, when we talk about the crime that we see, the violence that we see, the way that people hurt each other, it is a way to put an end to that. It is hard, I'm not saying it's impossible, it is hard to be mean to somebody or harm somebody that is being kind to you. Didn't say it was impossible, but it's harder. And if we want the world to be a better place, and, and, we, and the whole world may not be able to agree on a lot of things, but I think that's one thing we could get everybody to agree on. We all want the world to be a better place. This is a way for us, all of us, to do it. And the more important reason is, it's what God wants us to do with mankind. God wants us to reach out to everyone that we come in contact with. Whether it was the guy sitting behind me at the ball game, who I don't know and will never see again. Whether it was the guy that you hold the door open for so they can come in or out. Whether it's a neighbor that comes over and plows out your driveway when there's a whole bunch of snow on it and you're sitting there going, boy, I really wish I knew how I was gonna get rid of this. Or if this, I like to call them, or if I could just get the snow fairy to come and help me out. Whatever that is. The Muncie Mission has people that come and volunteer to help them, but they have no idea that they're going to come and help them. Do you, do you have any idea how many people walked yesterday? Okay, I haven't seen anything yet. But they've done that for a number of years. And the reason they pick February is they want it to be cold. They, hope, they don't want it to be so cold they have to cancel, but they want it to be cold enough so that you understand what people that are homeless or that don't know exactly where they're going to spend night to night, you can feel that same kind of cold they feel. The only difference is most of those people in the walk know that they've got a place that they can go to when they're done that's going to be warm, and they know they're going to have food. Not, not all those people the first time they go to the mission do they know that. But God wants us to reach out to the whole world. Okay, so if you can hear, they had 800 people register to walk. Probably means they, some people show up that didn't register and some people won't show up. So they probably had around 800 then. So 800 people walked, they went from the field house back to the mission again, right? And that takes, I've done it before. It seemed like it took me 20 or 25 minutes, but it was pretty cold the time I did it, and so I was walking pretty fast. Even into the wind, it was still, still cold, but I couldn't wait to get on the bus to come back to my car. Because it was cold. We have that ability to reach out to all those people around us. And sometimes it isn't that they need something from us monetarily. They don't need a warm place to stay. They don't need money to buy gas to go to a hospital. They don't need something from us other than they need us to know that we care about them, that we're concerned about them. Whether it's a neighbor that's lost a spouse or a loved one, whether they have an illness and they need to be comforted in that way, that is another way of, of reaching out and sharing with people. So what I'd like for you guys to do 
So I haven't, give, I haven't given homework in a long time, right? How long has it been? Weeks, right? Maybe months, not years. That wouldn't be true. But it's been a while. And so what I'd like for you to think about is you have this opportunity to reach out to family and friends and neighbors and people that you don't know and people that you may only meet one time. Go out of your way to be kind to them. Don't do just what's expected, but do more than what's expected. So this is my best doing more than what's expected story. It's kind of old, but it's the best one I've got. We're at Disney World. Not the most inexpensive place to go in the whole entire world. And we're staying at the Disney End. And it storms. Elisha was young, and so we came back to the hotel to sleep. And it storms. And it stormed for two hours. Poured, thundered and lightning, the whole mess. But we want to go back to the Magic Kingdom to see the light show parade. And so there's about 30 of us out there standing in front of the Disney Inn. And one guy says, boy, I'm glad I'm not trying to get from my car to the park or the park to my car in this storm. And they have those ladies and gentlemen there, and I, I don't know if they call them a host or a greeter or whatever. And she says to the group of us, says it to him, but we all can hear, she goes, you know, you're lucky to be staying here. And I thought, it didn't seem all that lucky when I paid the bill. But the guy says, why am I lucky to be staying here? She said, well, you know, when it storms like this, they will let you in the park to park, but you have to stay in your car until the lightning's gone. It's not safe to be in those big open parking lots and lightning storm in Florida. And if you're in the park, you can come up to the gate to catch a, a tram to go to your car, but you have to stay in the park until the storm's over. And the guy said, you mean for the last two hours, everybody that came thinking they were going to come into the park and everybody who's in the park drenching wet wanting to go to their car had to stay where they are. And she goes, yeah, it's the only safe way to transport people. But she, and then she went, but you guys are lucky because in a couple minutes that bus is going to come right up here and pick you up and the storm's over by now. She goes, and you're not going to wait at all. You're all going to get on the bus. You're going to go right over there to the Magic Kingdom, and you're going to be able to see the parade. And there's going to be so many people that probably won't get in the park tonight because of the storm. And I thought, we are lucky. And she didn't have to tell us that story, and I'm sure Disney wanted her to tell that story, but she didn't have to do that. She went out of her way to make the rest of us from all over the place feel better about being at Disney. And we didn't even know we should have felt better about being at Disney. What I'd like for you guys to do is make everyone you come in contact with feel better about wherever they are, even if they didn't know they were supposed to feel better about where they are. It shouldn't be a secret. And if nothing else, and we all have friends, people we know that are, what was the dog's name that everything was droopy dog or, help me, it was a cartoon? Not Eeyore, this was a dog, this was really a dog. Big long ears, everything was always, oh, it's so bad. So my, you know, if he got fed supper, it would have been the wrong supper. Everything was bad. We all know somebody like that in our life. The glass is always, a, you know, instead of being three quarters full, it's a quarter empty. We all know somebody like that. And so don't let them bring you down and raise them up. And if nothing else, if you can't think anything else to say to them, Say, you know what? God loves you, and God cares for you. So if nothing else, if you can't think of anything else to say, at least you can at least tell them that. Because we know it's true, and surely they can't find a way to turn that into a negative. And so that's your homework. Reach out to neighbors, people you don't know, family, friends, and lift them up and let them let them come to expect that no matter whatever you do, it'll be better than your best for every single one of them, whether they do the same to you or not. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful again that we have the freedom to come together to worship and to praise you. Let us take that joy out into your world and share it with all those that we come in contact with. Amen. Amen.